Okay. We are live now. We shall be starting in a minute. Okay, here we go. Yeah, we are live on Facebook. Greetings to all our audience. It's always a pleasure to host you on Sadrep Africa platform. This is a place where we believe that broken crayons steal color. Welcome to this segment. This is Brighter Days segment. This is our monthly talk show that is brought every last Friday of the month, uh, whereby we tend to cover different relevant topics based on real and authentic stories to give hope and also transform lives. Remember that we are live on Sadref Africa Facebook page. So to our audience, uh, feel free to host watch parties, share on your timeline, and also uh, you could invite someone to this conversation. Maybe to get to know uh, more about Sadref Africa, I would request that uh, you may check us, you may check um, our website, uh, that is uh, sadref.com and also visit our Facebook page. You may like and follow and also share that link with someone and also subscribe to our um, YouTube channel, that is Sadref Africa. As part uh, of our belief, we always say that uh, uh, the audience is part of this, you are part of this conversation. So I also wish to invite all of our viewers to be part of this raw and candid conversation. So kindly engage uh, by going to the chat box. You may put your question, you may put your comments if you have any thoughts or concerns or any experience as far as our topic is concerned, kindly feel free uh, to put it in the chat. We shall try as much to sample and react to them as we continue. So I would wish to invite you uh, to our discussion today. And uh, our discussion, it is said that div uh, divorcees have a more comprehensive outlook on marriage. That is a 360 degrees view to the best, the good, the bad, and the downright ugly of what this complex institution is all about. There are benefits and also there are lessons learned from uh, mistakes done. We say that every uh, relationship and every breakup is an opportunity for growth and to develop as a person. And you may also use it, uh, you may also use the hard earned lessons to help someone going through the same or similar situation. My name is Jenny Washira, and I will be your host. We are on episode nine today, and our topic of discussion is when a marriage unravels. And we shall be focusing on marriage lessons from people who have had an experience with divorce. Uh, we will not try to speak to three groups of people as we continue with this conversation, who are um, those planning to get into marriage, maybe the first or the second marriage. The second category, uh, those people already in marriages, and also the third category is those on the borderline. Maybe you are contemplating uh, to call it quit. And to expand and explore on this, I'm privileged to host an amazing panelist who will help us just look at the wider picture of this discussion. And I'm really happy to have Ruth and Amani who have both experienced divorce and we'll be sharing uh, a bit of their story and the lessons learned from that. We also have Monica with us, 
who is a counseling psychologist and she will help us from a professional perception. Yeah, so I would wish to welcome you all and just uh, start by um, introduction. We get to know and understand you better. Maybe I would, uh, intro I would uh, call upon Ruth just to introduce yourself briefly before we get down to the conversation of the day. Welcome, Ruth. Thank you, Jenny. And uh, thank you for the wonderful opportunity to share my story and uh, to be a blessing and help. Uh, to those who may be facing that in-between place of uh, whether to quit or whether to keep, keep uh, the marriage. I appreciate it. So my name is Ruth Wanjiro. Um, I was married for six years and I've been divorced for six years, so I'm at the break-even point. Um, 38 years, uh, an insurance practitioner. My profession is actually insurance. I'm also an entrepreneur. And uh, I'm also the founder of a new platform, a new YouTube platform that uh, has grown over the years called The Healing Boudoir. It uh, made its debut on YouTube just recently, but it has been an audio space where we encourage uh, divorcees, and it's, it's a baby of mine that I really love. Um, I'm a happy-go-lucky girl, a very joyous girl, a very open-minded girl, and I'm somewhat a rebel against tradition. So whenever you mention tradition, my blood gets boiling. And I, I really believe that um, uh, tradition and socialization has a lot to do with the high divorce rate that we are currently seeing in a very traditional country. So thank you for having me. I look forward to having fun and sharing my story. Okay. Sorry for that. Uh, okay, sorry. I think my internet had uh, an issue. Kidogo, Amani, you can go. Uh, let's get to know you. All right. Thank you for the opportunity, and it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, my name is Amani Maranga. I'm a communicator by profession. I'm also a mediator. I am a speaker. Uh, MC. I make money when I talk, and people listen. Ge generally. You know, that's, that's what I do. Um, I'm also the founder of a podcast called Living Truthfully, which is a, um, a space I, I created two and a half years ago for initially for me to be able to express my thoughts uh, that, I, that I felt needed to be said, but uh, it has grown into a space, a safe space for men to speak and give the narrative that is, that rarely has the opportunity to be said in a safe space. Um, I am divorced, uh, like Ruth, which is quite uncanny. Um, I was married for about just, just close to seven years. And uh, this is my seventh year out of my marriage. So uh, I have now had, it is called a break even point. So uh, I, I guess that's where I'm at. Um, and I say that with not with pride, but with humility, because I guess the, the the learning curve, both married and out of my marriage, has been very steep. Um, and so, I am work in progress. And if there is value in that work in progress, then I'm happy to share it. Thank you for having me. Okay. Thank you so much, Amani, for that introduction. Maybe we can have Monica go. Monica, can you hear oh, me? You yes, yes, yes. My name is Monica Karyoki. I've been married for 28 years. And um, I'm the founder of Early Ministry, where we have uh, a counseling center and uh, located uh, at Dagoreti Corner. We also have uh, other groups like uh, Family Support Forum, where we are about a hundred women that we pray for marriages, for families, and of course for our country. And also we have another pillar in early ministry that uh, is called Inner Healing, where we talk to people and we try to help them um, find themselves and talk about issues and sometimes childhood issues 
that they might be uh, you know going through or might be affecting them today also we have uh, another pillar called the fascinating womanhood uh, this one we talk to women and we try to encourage them so that they can uh, do some small things uh, to make their marriages happy and better. We also have uh, community empowerment uh, programs that we hope uh, mostly women to do some income generating activities. And finally, we have early marriage missions. This one we have uh, or we uh, empower women, uh, those who are getting married in premarital counseling and we also do bridal showers. Wow. Okay. Thank you. Thank, Thank you for this yeah. opportunity. I thank God for this opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, Monica, for that intro. And I really want to appreciate all the guests and uh, for this far. And maybe uh, to start us off, as I uh, can pose as a question as we start off, uh, we are all aware about uh, the marriage institution. It has been under siege. There's so much that has been happening. And sometimes we try to think, is it uh, uh, the people who are failing? Is it the church who are not doing their part? Is it uh, our kind of being, uh, the way people were brought up? What exactly, where is the problem? Uh, and is there anything that people are not told the truth? You know, because um, you know, once uh, we get to the premarital classes, it's all about the good things, it will be rosy and all that, but we are not told about the other things. So I would like, uh, by the help of our panelists, maybe um, as you share your experience, because I know you have both experiences, uh, being in and uh, also out of marriage, Maybe you can bring us up to speed just to get to understand a brief of your um, history in marriage, divorce. I know you've mentioned a bit of that, but just taking us to uh, that, uh, do you feel like uh, any of this affected? Maybe you didn't know the truth uh, as you're getting into it and uh, what better can be done? Maybe I'll start with Ruth. Okay, thank you, Jenny. Um, I thought I knew the truth when uh, getting into, into marriage, as, as we all do. A young 26-year-old girl, rose-colored glasses, very excited to make her husband happy. You know, you don't imagine that uh, within the first three months, uh, your husband will, come, will be coming home in the morning instead of running home to his hot new thing. That, that it never, never, ever, ever prepares you for that. But over time, to be honest, what I have learned, which is, I think, what the kind of value I would add to the listeners is that we are using uh, a nyongo to try and cook on an induction cooker. An induction cooker is probably the most, um, it's the newest technology in terms of, of cooking. So we are taking this traditional thing and putting it on um, a modern, a modern day equipment. Instead of looking for the correct uh, way of, of doing things, the fundamentals of marriage will always remain the same. Uh, faithfulness, companionship, friendship, they remain the same. But the way we are approaching marriage nowadays simply has to change. I was smiling when Monica was saying she does bridal showers because I personally stopped attending bridal showers. I find them a joke because the kind of, um, uh, advice given there is not relevant to my generation. So yes, our mothers had their marriages, but we cannot use the same, uh, the same methods that they used to take care of the husbands of this generation. The women of my generation are different. The men of my generation are different. So we can't apply the same old things and expect different results. We need um, a group that can come out like we are doing to say that marriage is very different. You have an empowered woman, you have an educated woman, you have a woman who's well aware of her sexuality and has demands. And, uh, and therefore you need to learn how to live with that kind of a woman. Then you come, uh, you, you have a man uh, in the house who's struggling with his identity as a man in the midst of having um, a very, a very uh, open-minded and, and, and self-aware woman, well, he was expecting to have a woman similar to his mother in the house. 
So we have to, to first accept that we have to do things differently. The fundamentals will remain the same, but we've got to get a new formula of uh, how to do things. I, I know one of the greatest mistakes and assumptions that I made in my marriage was that I, I didn't ask my husband, uh, my ex-husband, what he expected from a wife. I assumed. I assumed um, it, it's obvious he had known me for two years, so I expect that he knows what kind of a woman I am. Uh, my expectations of him of a husband also, uh, I probably didn't communicate them very well. So he came in as a traditional husband, Eleni provider. I am here, um, as long as you have the, my name at the end of it, that's it. But this girl wanted more. She wanted affection, she wanted somebody she can speak with, somebody she can have intellectual conversations with, which we did when dating. But when the roles changed to my, my wife and husband, it, it, it wasn't enough for me. And he, on the other hand, I came to learn later, expected a girl who will sit in the house, show up with him to church, show up with him for family functions. But that's not what I am. If you want that, then you simply get a girl from the village and bring her to the city. So we need to understand these roles and, 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 and the new way of doing marriage and understanding the modern woman, the modern man, in the light of these fundamental marriage principles. Wow, that's so powerful, uh, Ruth. Uh, some sentiments there about communication and just having uh, the rules rolled out in a uh, in a good way. Maybe uh, Amani, uh, you can share with us your experience and tell us maybe if you agree with what Ruth is saying as far as your uh, experience and uh, your life. Uh, marriage and divorce life is concerned. I'm trying to write some notes because uh, wisdom has been spoken. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I will, I'm, I'm happy to learn as well. Often when I sit in panels like this, um, I'm usually at loggerheads with the female side of this conversation, but I find myself um, agreeing with most of what Ruth has said. And I think what I can, oh, these are current thoughts, you know, um, I was brought up in a very Christian home. I was, um, you know, very traditional, if I could use that word in, in, in its thinking. Um, uh, part of my story is public. Um, I got married to the lady who was, um, who had my daughter, who had my firstborn daughter. So we got a child before we got married. And, um, you know, that already upset the, I'd call it natural order of things, but I'm calling it that way because of the perspective that I came from. Um, and, and what, uh, just to, to add a word to what Ruth has said, you know, I, I agree that some fundamentals of marriage haven't changed, but the context definitely has changed. You know, um, the context has changed. And I think that's what she was trying to say about, you know, the, using a nyungu to, nyungu to to cook on an induction, you know, uh, space, an induction kitchen or induction uh, heater. Um, and, and because the context has changed, I don't feel like the preparation of marriage has followed or at least has um, worked towards, you know, understanding this context and taking this context into consideration as we do premarital counseling. I went through premarital counseling. We did, we, we, we followed the steps, you know, uh, in our circumstance. However, that was not enough uh, to save our marriage at the time. And to be honest, many marriages that have fallen, even having gone through those, you know, those steps. And I'll, 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 I'll own up early and say that, you know, I was a catalyst to the end of our marriage. I made some mistakes, but I do know that there was more than that that ended our marriage. And, 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 and a lot of that has to do with the context that we are in. I will take exception to the way she she typecasted the man, and say you know you know she she made this balance of a um, empowered woman and a man who is seeking identity. You know I I think there's more to the men than the typecast, but that's not what's important to this conversation. What I'll say is that we have a very a rapidly changing context, um, and and that rapidly changing context is. I don't think there's any institution that has been able to catch up with it. 
Um, and so, yes, we are preparing people for marriages with a very old manual that does not take into consider consideration a lot of the things that have gone in today. However, some of the mistakes that are made in marriages are old mistakes as well, <laughs> you know. <laughs> They're not, they're, they're not necessarily new, you know? Uh, and I think, and that's the truth for me as well. So I think the, where I'd like to start is to say that we need to, and if I ever get the, sec the chance to, 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 to walk down that path, um, we need to look at the whole idea of marriage with very different lenses. And this is what I mean. And I'm gonna ask some questions. Um, marriage as we know it today, is it a Christian idea or is it a Western idea? Okay. Um, is there anything wrong with how some of our traditional marriages were done and some of the thinking behind it, not necessarily the entire context, but the thinking behind it? You know, the second question I'll ask is, um, which marriages are ending? At which rate? Is it Christian marriages? Is it Hindu marriages? Is it Muslim marriages? Or is it marriages as a whole? What's the context of that, this scenario? Because I don't think you need to be a Christian to have a successful marriage. And I'm saying that as a Christian, you know, we've seen other religions have very successful marriages. So is it something in our formula that's not working? And that I think that's a question that needs to be considered, you know, carefully. Um, and then lastly is even the question of our vows, you know, and, and, and the, the processes that we go through, but especially those vows. Um, are they a Christian idea, again, or are they a Western idea? Did we fall into the trap um, of, you know, culture being transferred with religion and, and, and took it wholesale? And the reason I'm saying this is because I'm asking this question, and these are current questions in my head. I'm not asking them just to rile people up, but I'm asking them because the things I'm concerned about. Um, the reason I'm asking this question is, is it that we are setting up marriages to fail from the beginning? Uh, and those are my, mm -hmm. those are my thoughts for now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow, well, th those are very, very deep concerns and questions uh, that you have raised. And uh, the thing is, are we setting up uh, marriages to fail by what we are doing, and I think something uh, that I've loved the question that we are asking, are we preparing people for marriage using the old manual? Are we asking with how uh, things are going? And uh, I just want to uh, remind our viewers, kindly uh, put your questions there. If you have any answer to what Amani has asked, kindly put it there so that we will be reviewing them as we continue. Uh, kindly let's make it as engaging as possible. Yeah, and uh, on that, uh, as we continue even uh, uh, just addressing what Amani has raised, Monica, I would invite you and maybe one of the things you can tell us, because you've told us you prepare pe uh, people for marriages, yeah? So maybe you can start us off and tell us, uh, are we, um, are you using the old manuals? What manuals are you using? And uh, are we actually uh, doing what we are supposed to do? Are we borrowing the Western culture or what exactly are we doing? Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. Those are hard questions from Amani, and I might not even be able to answer those questions. And also uh, very good insights from Ruth. Uh, I, I think I'm also, you know, expanding my knowledge and even my thought processing. One thing I want to say is that um, our churches are trying, our pastors, our fathers, reverends are trying to prepare people for marriage and uh, I think it's Amani who said he went through premarital counseling and I also remember my, I also went through this premarital counseling but I can say it was not enough so my stand is if uh, 
counselors, therapists can work with the pastors, maybe it can be uh, it, it can be better. It can now uh, it can equip this uh, couple to better face uh, any um, anything that will come along in uh, in their marriage life. I want to say that um, some of the things that we prepare people, uh, the couples, uh, when they are uh, about to get married, and I want to say it is not the one for uh, the one that the church is doing because the church sometimes does it in a hurry because there is a wedding that is coming. The premarital counseling I'm talking about is something to do with like a, a duration of like two years or one and a half. Uh, meaning that these people are in courtship and then they give themselves a time to know each other. And some of the topics that we deal with are expectations in marriage, also communication in marriage. And I know Amani asked whether we are using the old manual or we are borrowing from Western. What I would want to say is that whatever we do at early ministry is that we borrow from the Bible. I know there are other people who are not Christian. And of course, he asked this question, whether it is only the Christian marriages that are failing or even others. As a therapist, I, would, I can say it is from all cultures. It's not only Christian. But as um, a Christian counselor, who is also a therapist, and I can also, you know, I have clients from other parts of the, uh, you know, of the world, I can say that, it is true, marriages are failing. Uh, and sometimes it's because of expectations. And uh, I, I think it is Ruth who was talking about uh, um, the marriage that was traditional, or is it Amani? I can't remember who was saying about something to do with the, the traditional and whatever marriages that we have. I believe uh, traditional marriages were even better, people were better prepared than today. But I believe there is a chance. The best is to be prepared, have the best, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, a good time to, to, to prepare this couple. And uh, if other things happen because of whatever is happening, we know nowadays the wife cannot be at home cooking all through. There is change. We need to be empowered, all of us. But at least people must sit down as agree and agree as a couple. What happens in this particular marriage might, might not be happen, you know, happening to this particular marriage. I think there is a, a time, by, you know, the, the, uh, people need to sit down, agree on how they want to continue with their marriage. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Monica, for that. Yes, as we continue uh, exploring on that, and uh, thank you for the, the new insights that uh, Amani and you brought up, and even Monica, yeah, because I think uh, we are here to help, uh, to uh, try help uh, the people who are struggling out there, and maybe to read a few comments. Thank you, Rachel Mwangi. She has said deep, the insights are making me question everything I know about marriage. Yes, Joan Wandera, thank you. She says, yes, I feel that you are using the old manual, but the reality on the ground is different. Uh, uh, Judy Morogo, thank you. That's deeper money, very deep questions. May God intervene as we seek guidance. Thank you, Duncan, as you follow this conversation. Uh, thank you, Gladys, can, uh, candid people, candid conversation. Thank you for that. And thank you, Ruth. Thank you for speaking out for many. That's Judy saying. Lina is saying, preach, Ruth, preach. We need more. So uh, we have people who are following and uh, really contributing. So uh, from what we have heard and where we have reached so far, I know there are lessons also we learned yeah, from the mistakes done by us, by uh, maybe the society, and also by other people. And what I say, uh, we have learned our lessons and we know we can point them out. Maybe starting with, with uh, Ruth, there's what maybe, uh, just being candid, you like uh, getting to this other end, you learned that maybe you, you did, uh, maybe in your marriage, something that you did or you did not do. It's called the, the whatever, you know, omission or, you know, yeah. 
that really contributed maybe to, uh, to the breakup, but maybe if given another opportunity or rather you can do what you can collect that. It's good to know us, uh, to let us know those mistakes so that for many of us maybe who are uh, in marriages struggling with the same thing, they can also uh, be able to point them out. Thank you, Jenny. Um, well, I hope when you say given another opportunity, you mean with a different man, because it, it can't be with the same, definitely. So, yes, given another opportunity, <laughs> given another opportunity, I, I would not be afraid to rock the boat. Um, I think I was very sensitive about conflict. And I really tried to avoid conflict in the, in the marriage. So I would overlook a lot of things and probably keep them until a bit too late when I'm sharing with, uh, when, I, when, when, I, when it now came to point to share with him. I would drop the boat and I would drop it early, uh, preferably when, when dating about what I'm uncomfortable uh, about. Because by the time you're speaking to this person, you've held in your anger for so long that you're, you're bitter about the, the issue. You can't even hear him properly because you're very bitter about the issue that you're talking about. So I would be more open. I would um, talk about my displeasure very quickly um, because that even gives, it, it keeps you more sane when, when having that conversation because things have not performed within you. One very important word that Monica has used, which for me in retrospect, I now believe is the foundation of any marriage. And even for, for those who are married or those who are getting into marriage is one word. Marriage is about one word, agreement. Whenever I look at the Bible, I'm a Christian, I'm a born again Christian. I keep going back into my marriage and telling guys that I have come to learn that the basis of any marriage is Amos 3.3. And I read it from the NLT version. It says, can two people walk together unless they have agreed on the direction? That's it. You sit, you agree, you understand each other, and you agree. Our African marriages just involve way too many people, way too many people. From the church to your parents to your folks, marriage is about two people. Let them come up with a vision. Let them come up with a direction. Let them even come up with a definition of the kind of marriage they want. Like I, I would like to define to um, like uh, my fiance, I would like to define to him what my understanding is of a wife. I don't want you to go to any literature. I don't want you to ask anybody. I want to tell you what I understand, what the, the kind of wife I can be to you. And if that's not enough for you, then I release you to find the kind of wife that you wish to have. I would also like to understand from my fiance when that time comes, um, what, what does he understand by the title husband? From him, his own um, customized uh, description, that way I will know whether I can accommodate it, whether it's enough for me, his definition of a husband. And if it's not, then I let him go. So if we can agree on what marriage is from the get-go, then we can have our own beautiful customized union that is protected from, from, from the kind of, of, of pressures that, that marriage have. For you to have a, a true, a solid agreement, there has to be vulnerability, mutual vulnerability between the two of you. There has to be listening and listening, we're talking of, of, of not, not listening to answer, but truly listening to understand this person better. I, I should have asked um, quite a, a number of questions uh, to, to, to my ex-husband that I probably was too young and, and I, you know, you really were, I really wanted to get married, so you don't want to bring in issues. But now, even when I did, I ask so many questions that if you're not the kind of a person who's, um, uh, who's, who's not up for an interrogation, and I do call it an interrogation, you'll just, you'll quit it. And, and I don't mind it because I would rather have the peaceful life than I have than have a rocky marriage. So agreement is everything. And we, if again, um, you, you look at the benefits of agreement, I go back to the word of God, Matthew 18, 19. If we, if we agree as in Amos 3, 3, then we read the um, Matthew 18, 19. And I like it from the amplified version. It says, again, I tell you, 
if two of you on earth agree, and then the Amplified expands the word agree, it says harmonize together, make a symphony together about whatever, anything or everything that you may ask, it will come to pass and be done for you by my father in heaven. So if two people can sit and agree on their version, like Amani mentioned, are the vows that we, we usually um, have in church, are they really relevant for our generation? Because for me, I, I, there are things I, I now uh, think of that I said, I'm like, I, I, I won't leave out, I won't live through your nonsense. I just won't. I mean, um, but, but the vows are very, our, our vows are very limiting. So can we, can we agree as two people then bring in the third parties and tell them this is what the two of us have agreed on and we would like you to share in our new life. If you wish, we're not asking for your opinions, just your blessing and to tell you that we are together. Those are the, those are the, those, those are the lessons I learned and, as, and of friendship as well. Because Jenny, euphoria dies, um, sexual appeal dies, body parts sag, some even stop working, all these things. Uh, are temporary, but friendship, friendship, friendship will never die. Think of how you you look at you you think of your friends, how their family becomes your family vol voluntarily. You think of their siblings and their parents as your own. When you think of a friend, it's the person that you want to share the good and the bad. You know you you never feel like um, there's there's a burden that when your friend is sad, you're sad too. Sometimes friends are so close that through telepathy, you can tell when your friend is low or when your friend um, um, needs a call or some encouragement. So if our African um, setting can allow us to think of friendship more than the role of a, of a wife or a husband as it is today, I think we can go very, very far because I love being around my friends. I'm intentional about my friendship. So even for my second time round, uh, for me, it's I'm looking for a friend who will double up as a spouse and a purpose partner. So I'm really not out here looking for a husband. I, I had one of those and it didn't go very well. I'm looking for a friend, mm -hmm. a good, loving friend. <laughs> Thank you for that, Ruth. Hey, hey. That's very deep. And uh, from your... Uh, conversation, I can hear uh, a lot of uh, things failing from the even before saying I do getting into the marriage or relationship before knowing exactly what you are getting into. And uh, maybe we can get uh, Amani's insights uh, just to pick uh, from what Ruth uh, has said and then we get to hear your views as well. All right. Uh, thank you, Jenny. And yeah, Ruth has said some things that. Uh, interesting um, and, and a lot a lot to think about I like that definition uh, if, if Ruth if you're on tinder that's such a good definition for what I'm looking for a friend who doubles up as a spouse and purpose partner uh, and I'd, I'd be curious to know how many swipe right um, there's um, Allow me to first address something she said, and mm -hmm. then I'll give you some of my thoughts. Okay. Um, and and uh, maybe it's a, you know, an addition or, or a caveat uh, of sorts. Uh, but Ruth, you talk about agreement, and I'm completely in agreement with that. That you know, we, we there needs to be, you know, some sort of cohesion on the direction that you want to go. I do want to add a thought to that. And I said, you, you need to, and, and the thought that I wrote down is that it needs to be continuous agreement. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you why, because we change, we evolve and we grow. And, and an agreement we made five years ago might need evaluating, it might need evolving, it might need you know, uh, to, to change with us, just like we live in a rapidly changing world. Um, and I think, you know, uh, one of the things that I would, I would hope that my next marriage, if I get married, is, is um, one where there's room for 
continuous evaluation of what that agreement looks like. One of the things I realized from my past, I just turned 40 um, about, about a week and a half ago. And, um, you know, 40 is a very reflective time. I, I don't know why, I guess there's a pressure of, you know, either you've lived 40 years or life starts at 40, you know, I don't know. But um, I, my 30s were when I enjoyed most of my success and my 30s is when also my marriage failed. Uh, and so, you know, I've had time to look back in that, at that decade and, and look at it from, from that perspective and say, I, I changed. And I didn't have the opportunity to have the conversation about how I'm changing or evolving with my ex-wife. And she was changing and growing too, but we, that was not a conversation that we had. So if I'm gonna give a lesson or some lessons, I have written four things and I'll just share them quickly, is one, uh, this continuous agreement, but also what it means is that let's sit down every so often, two years, three years, five years, whatever it is, let's sit down and say, who are we now? And maybe even do a reintroduction, you know? Uh, so that, you know, there is a, you understand where we are going, even though we have a general direction of agreed to go, how are we growing and evolving in that direction? That's the first thing. But the second, which should have been earlier, but I chose to start with this because of what Ruth said, uh, would be, why are we getting married? Why? In my, in my circle of friends, and I'll, I'll speak about some of the men in my life, when I, when I look at the marriages that have failed, there's something common with the men specifically, is that when we got married, there was a sense of obligation. It's a very subtle, but very interesting uh, thing because whether it was a sense of obligation from family, whether it was a sense of obligation because you have a child, whether it's a sense of obligation from church, you know, where churches are pushing people towards getting married, uh, is that the men feel like they were sort of nudged to make this choice as opposed to making the choice by, out of their own will. And what happened is that when, uh, I need to uh, filter my language, when problem comes, <laughs> when problems come, then you find uh, little reason to fight for the marriage. Because disagreements will come. They'll come because you're different. They'll come because you have different backgrounds. They'll come because even with agreements, they'll come because we have all different experiences that we've had. We will look at some things differently. It's normal. But, you know, when that, you know, proverbial poo-poo hits the proverbial fan, then it's, you find that people are not willing to fight for the relationship. And it's because you feel I was not, I didn't want to be here in the first place, you know, uh, or I didn't, this was not a choice that I made myself. It was a choice that was, I was forced to make, so to speak. You know, well, and that is whether it was blatant or whether it was something subconscious, but it's there. So evaluating the reason people want to get married, I think that's an important one. But now getting into the marriage itself, I think one of the things I've learned for myself is the humility. Um, you know, uh, Monica talked about expectations. Um, we go in with our expectations, and I think there's some level of humility that needs to check in when you learn that. Your expectations are yours. They don't belong to your partner. They are yours. You carry them by yourself. You know, and so, you know, at some point you have to evaluate uh, whether your expectations are more important than your partner. You know, and how, how do you how do you bring that into the table? There's entitlement. You know, uh, and this one I'm directing at the other gender, uh, and so the <laughs> so. <laughs> I think humility, and, and, and that's on both parts. For me, I, I think that was the biggest lesson uh, that I've learned from my marriage. I, I, I think there are some things I could have done different if I was a little more humble, and, and if I was mm -hmm. willing to be a little more humble. Lastly, is uh, something I call emotional integrity. I'll explain it. You've heard of emotional intelligence, you've heard of emotional quotient, um, I am the proponent, not the founder, not the beginner of this word, but the, the promoter of the word uh, emotional integrity. And what it is, is feeling what you're feeling. 
and this is, I'm speaking to my gender now, uh, where we have been taught to hide, to deny, to suppress our emotions. Uh, you know, uh, to use the word, the truth was used, which was a very apt word, vulnerability. And, you know, we, we do not know often, and that's true, we don't know, but and even when we do, it's very uncomfortable for us to allow ourselves to feel what we're feeling and more importantly, communicate it. And I, you know, regardless of the mistakes I made in my marriage, I learned that this was one of my biggest failures where I was not, the word integrity comes from the word integer, which is a Latin word for whole, for one. Um, and the, uh, my integrity when it came to my emotions was compromised because I didn't, I never let in, I never let out, I never you know, showed what I was really feeling, whether it was good or bad. And so that was a, that, that was a big challenge in my marriage and a challenge that I own. Um, and that's something I'm working on. However, having said that my, and owning that this is a problem mostly with my gender, I will say that we need a safe space for our, vulnerability to be nurtured. Someone gave me a very good analogy where if we give an, a vulnerability, then it's like that, uh, I know we are Christians, we don't believe in voodoo, but and, uh, you know, there's, in voodoo, there's this thing called a juju bin doll, which someone takes, you know, and then they keep it in the house. And then if they want it to feel pain, they stab it or, you know, things like that. And, Often that's how our vulnerability is treated. It's treated like a juju bin doll. And so it is used against us. And a lot of men have been banned for showing any level of vulnerability, uh, especially to the women. And, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Let me, let me just, uh, let me put this out there and I hope you'll give me just one more minute. Let me put this out there mm -hmm. and say the standard of how men show emotions and how that is received is very different from the way women are received when they show emotion. The same emotion is treated differently. I'll give you an example. If a man is sad and he cries, he's often called weak. The show of tears is just, it's weakness. And this, is, this may be an archaic way of looking at it, but I know very many modern people who look at it this way, including modern women. When a man is scared, the whole family is scared, you know? When a man is scared, he has no room to be scared alone. <laughs> Do you understand? If he shows that emotion, it affects everyone around him. And, you know, it, it causes insecurity to the family, to the wife and to the children. So he really doesn't have permission to be scared. When a man is angry and he tries to express that anger, even in the most demure manner, it's called abuse. If a man speaks and you know raises his voice, it's abuse. Mm. It's the filter for our emotions is very different. And so we do not have a safe space to express our emotions. And yet you want us to be vulnerable. Where will we be vulnerable? Well, it's getting hot in here. Those are very, very deep insights, I tell you. Yeah, let me read some of the comments before I comment on what uh, Mani has said. Duncan, thank you. He said it is very important for couples to work out their friendship which acts as a glue which holds them together. Thank you, Nyaushi. I like Amani's questions, deep and very candid. Keep your comments coming, your experience, and uh, even what has been raised by Amani, you can uh, still write it there. I uh, will continue reading them. Amani, uh, there's something I love about uh, what you have said. I know it's known in the society, and um, for men, they don't easily own up. They are, mistakes or uh, decisions or whatever they made. But even for you to come out right, even from the beginning and say that I was a catalyst, you know, I think that's something I really need to commend you about. Uh, because as you say, men are known as much as they are the stronger, you know, uh, they're expected to be the 
a strong agenda, they also cover themselves. They don't want to admit, but it's good that you've come out even just to speak for that gender and say for sure, this is what uh, happened. And for sure, we are told that it takes two to tango. You know, uh, it's not at the amount of coming here and pointing fingers, blaming, blaming. No, no, no. There's also, we played for the failure or success of that relationship. And I just love that bit about it. And even the, whatever you brought it out about uh, just uh, the lessons, humility, and also the emotional integrity. And maybe getting uh, back to Monica, you can give us a comment or two uh, from what has been raised by uh, Ruth and Amani. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, what I can say is that um, we need to be intentional. Whatever we are doing in these marriages, it is very important to be intentional. Amani uh, raised very good questions on uh, why do we get married? Do we get married because there is a baby or because the family is telling us to get married because maybe you are over 30 or something like this. I think it is very important for us to know that we are getting to, to, to this relationship, you know, the marriage relationship, because we are also, uh, you know, we are prepared, we want to, but not the family of our, or other people are pushing us to these uh, institutions. And uh, of course, marriage is God's idea. It is not man's idea so i believe uh, it is good to to be prayerful uh in these uh, marriages we need to be very very prayerful because once we leave our marriage to just run the, just like that and of course the, we, we believe there is the the devil he doesn't like marriages uh, you know um thriving so it's very important for us to be praying for these marriages. Amani said that uh, men are, are not given an opportunity to, do, to be vulnerable. That is true. But I also want to remind us that uh, uh, God, it is a God-given uh, responsibility uh, for men to be the leader, to be the, the priest, to be uh, the ones holding uh, the, the, the family in a particular uh, way but we also remember they are also human beings so i pray that we can go to a, a level and um, accept men uh, as human beings who can uh, sometimes you know be wrong and uh, of course who need support in one or the other ways uh, but uh, of course we know in uh, in africa sometimes they also don't agree to be corrected very easily but we, of course, we, we know times are changing and they also sometimes are able to, to agree on this. One thing I want to say is that communication is very key in marriage. And uh, I think it's Ruth who said that she was not communicating how she was feeling. It's very, very important to, for us to, be, uh, to communicate. And uh, Ruth was saying that she got married at 26. And for me, as a psychologist, I can say uh, it was... Uh, it, she was, from my side, she was not very young because we normally say that the, the, the mind finished to develop at 25. So it means her mind was developed. Maybe she was not prepared fully uh, to the marriage, or I don't know, but uh, I, I can say it was better for me. I was younger than that, but I thank God I'm still here. But there are things that I've also learned in this marriage that I need to be intentional. I need to put my 100%. And also, I expect my husband to put the 100%. It is not me 40 uh, and him 60. It is both of us to put 100%. Another thing I want us to remember is that we need to forgive. Even if uh, to either want to forgive ourselves and also to forgive other people, because without forgiveness, we cannot get healing. Without forgiveness, we cannot uh, continue with another relationship. If there are things that we feel like uh, I did wrong, we need to forgive ourselves. If I feel like there are things my partner you know, did wrong to me, I need to forgive this person. And why do we forgive? One of the reasons uh, as to why we forgive is that we are commanded by God himself to forgive. So if we don't forgive, it will be very hard for us to heal completely. And if we are to 
uh, to have another, you know, a partner or continue with other relationship, it will hinder us. Another thing is we set ourselves free. When we forgive ourselves and we forgive other people, we set ourselves free and we don't, we won't be feeling guilty that I did ABCD or he or she did ABCD to me. We also give God room to avenge for us because when we don't forgive, it's like we want to fight the battle. And then, uh, you know, God tell us the battle belongs to him. So it's better we give God a room to fight for us. Also, we normally say there is no healing without forgiveness. If we are to forgive, if we are uh, to heal inside the wounds, and wounds that are psychological are only seen through behaviors. Wounds that are inside, they are emotional, we can always only see them through behavior. And sometimes we normally say it's better the wound that you can see. If you hurt at all, you'll feel pain, you'll uh, you take a, you know, paracetamol or and such. But the psychological wound, you need to go through the pain, you need to do something, you need to have a, a change of mind so that you, you get healed. You need even, uh, you know, some kind of uh, psychological uh, first aid, you need somebody to talk to somebody and uh, so that you get healed. And uh, finally, when I'm talking about forgiveness, we also say that we forgive to set the offender free. If we don't forgive that person who did ABCD to us, we, we are like holding them. We need to set them free. We need to forgive them. We need even to forgive ourselves so that we can start living again. Because uh, even if there was something that happened, maybe I did wrong and I, uh, you know, I, I, I all the time tell myself I am the one who did this, I might not be able to move forward. In order for me to move forward, I need to forgive myself. I need also to forgive the offender. I don't know whether I have more time or it's okay. Yeah, the, yeah, I wanted that um, uh, Ruth pick up uh, from what you have shared. Okay. And I think one key thing, um, maybe as we share Ruth as well, you can you can mention because my next uh, uh, question was about uh, the hard earned lessons, and maybe uh, through your experience, so what you went through, you have the hard earned lessons that maybe they have made you uh, a better person today, maybe compared to even during your marriage. So as you come in, maybe you can share a bit of that mm -hmm. and also uh, comment one or two things from what Monica and Namani have said. Okay, thank you. Um, my uh, key lessons were to always show up in any friendship or relationship as myself, not as expected by society, not as advised um, during showers or even in church. I show up as Ruth Wanjiro with all her glory, with all her issues, and make it, and, and, and make it clear from the journey of self-awareness that I've had because I've taken a lot of time by myself, inside myself, to understand who I really am because I, I really didn't know. I had... Um, you know, when you're growing up, you're informed by so many things. You're informed uh, by culture. You're informed by your gender roles, by school. I, I was this, I really didn't know who I am. So I muted a lot about myself. So in the next relationship, um, uh, long-term, let me put it this way, long-term relationship, I'm definitely showing up as myself. So it's a take it or leave it kind of a, of, of a thing. Um, I'm not muting myself for anybody. If, if I'm not the kind of woman you wish to have, then that is fine. I'm not for everybody. And that is a lesson I have come to understand. So then you're even able to handle any rejection issues better and in a more healthier way, uh, once you understand that you're not for everybody too. Um, a, a lesson I've learned is that um, the relationship is for me. As much as you have family and all that, it's for my joy and for my happiness. So regardless of what it looks like to others, um, opinions really don't matter. So if you find um, my, my 
partner serving you tea in the house, those kind of gender roles don't, don't matter to me. If he's fine with it, he will do it. Um, if you find us um, saying that we don't want visitors for a month because we'd like to spend some time together, that's our, it's our thing. So I won't take opinions. It will just be me and him and what we agree on. But there's one thing Amani mentioned and I would like to ask him a question because it's something that's very close to my heart on the vulnerability of the men. Because another, I, 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 I've said that I will give myself a gift in the next relationship. I will only attach myself to a man who's truly vulnerable and who can feel safe in my space. And I am training myself to be a safe space for that person. In the same way um, I'm a safe space to my closest, really closest friends, I'm training myself to be a safe space for a man. Now, it's very different when a man is your friend and when your man is your long-term partner. So Amani, what does a safe space for a partner look like for your gender to our gender? Like, Because it's hard for us to understand. We, we, you know, it's... um. Uh, like I, for me, I don't mind a partner crying because they've had a bad day. But what do you need? What does that look like? Explain it to my gender, a man's safe space, so that we can see whether we can create it for you in a, in a better way, especially with the kind of mental and emotional health issues that people are battling in our day and age. Help us, please. um so that's a very good question ruth thank you for asking that this will be the subject of our next webinar uh, which will be charging five thousand bob per pop uh, i hope you bring in all your your agenda i have a lot to say anyway i'm joking um so allow me to put a shameless plug here but i will i will attempt to answer your question and the shameless plug is if you if you have some time, uh, please go listen to episode 40 of my podcast, uh, Living Truthfully. Uh, this is something that we, we discuss uh, in depth. However, the opposite of a safe space is invalidation. Okay? The male experience in this time and uh, today is one where the man is constantly invalidated, constantly invalidated. Um, a man will say something and will, he will be corrected. A man will say something and it will not be heard as he said it, it will be given new meaning. Um, a man will show, like I said, an emotion and that emotion will be given an interpretation. It has no room to sit by itself. The, there's, it, it's like there's a, I, I, I'm, I don't mean to attack, but allow me to say this. Uh, it's like there's a need to always put the man in, to correct him, you know, it's, it's constantly, you know. Um, you know, there's this continuous joke about character development that men are giving women. But I think a man is always in what the corporate world calls PIP. Uh, performance improvement program. He is not enough as he is. The moment he gets into a woman's life, then she puts him on a performance improvement program. And so he is never enough as is. Invalidation is the opposite of a safe space for a man. And what I'd say is if you can acknowledge the man for who he is now, here today, and make him feel that that is enough. That as he shows up, just like the way you've said, you will show up as you are, that you allow him to just show up as he is and validate that. That man will work him, himself to reach the heights of whatever he needs to be. He's not yours to improve. Awesome, thank you for the lesson, noted, noted very well. I could already see the, the PIP part of it. And I think, again, it goes back to socialization, Jenny, because from our end, when getting married, we are taught that you've come to improve this man's life. Men are not usually organized. You know, 
So when you come in, and I can see where the issue is, Amani, you come in as, as a supervisor, almost. Come in as a supervisor to make this man, man's life better because men can't take care of themselves. And that's why I was, from the beginning, I talked about using, having a, a nyungu on an induction cooker. Listen to the difference. I mean, what he has said is so profound, but we are taught the exact opposite. So Jenny, thank you for this, this kind of conversation yeah. because from that one uh, uh, de description, I think many marriages could be saved and, and we could have better relationships that we don't come in as supervisors with PIP. Thank you. I will definitely wow. listen to episode wow. 40. Awesome. Wow. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much for that uh, insight and thank you even for, yeah, for that conversation. And uh, I want to believe somebody somewhere has been uh, uh, helped. Maybe uh, just to bring it uh, as we uh, as we plan to come to a wrap now, uh, and in your discussion, I've had uh, talking about of uh, having the next, uh, if you're given the next chance and all that. So I would like to ask, okay, if you still believe in the in marriage institution, and maybe together with that, uh, there's a, a question that I would want you wrap it up together uh, from. Uh, one of the viewers, and uh, maybe you can just mention in brief, uh, could the panelists share their healing process? Maybe Amani, as you tell us whether you still believe in the in marriage institution, maybe you can mention one or two, the healing process that you've gone through. There's a, a concerned person who really wants to know. Yeah. All right, uh, thank you for that. And thank you Ruth for acknowledging what I've said. Uh, um, that's, that, means, that means a lot. It does, and so thank you for that. Um, do I believe in the marriage institution? That's a trick question, Jenny. Uh, because what marriage institution are we talking about? Are we still making reference to the Nyungu? You know, and in that case, no. Uh, do I believe that it's possible for a man and a woman to make uh, a, a relationship that works, uh, that honors both them honors God and society, yes. Um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not planning to live alone for the rest of my life. Um, I just haven't found the formula for the next one. And I'm not looking very hard, I'm okay, as I am right now. Um, when it comes, it comes. My healing process. Oh, my healing process was a, was a long one and I think it's a continuous one. Like I said at the beginning of this, webinar, um, I'm work in progress. And I'm very aware I'm work in progress. So I don't speak from a place of saying, I'm not on any high horse. I, I know I learn every day just as I've learned today. And as, as Monica has acknowledged, we are expanding our knowledge. But I'll say this, I think the first step for me was to ac acknowledge my, my part, to own my part. Um, and owning my part, allowed me to be able to say I was wrong here and go back to my partner and say, I'm sorry. Um, but the, the, the other side of that coin is also not to own her part, <laughs> you know? It's to let her own her part as well. And, you know, that, that's, that, that was, um, and she did, which is great. And I'm, I'm very fortunate in that way. Uh, and, and, that that's a first one. The second thing was to forgive myself. Uh, as Monica said, that's very important. And you know, when I was struggling with forgiving myself, a friend of mine asked me a very important question. He asked me, "Do I believe that God has forgiven me?" And I said yes. And he asked me whether my court was higher than God's court. And I could not answer that question because it it my court is not higher than God's court. And sometimes we hang on to our failures. Um, and I, I feel like that's a form of pride. It's a form of pride because what, are, what am I saying that, you know, if God can forgive me, I'm, I'm too big to forgive myself, you know? Uh, so that forgiving myself was the second part of my process. The third was, it was just hard work. You know, I've, I've listened to people, I've listened to counsel, I've gone for therapy. I've done programs, not necessarily based on marriage, but to work on me, to 
allow my thought process to be interrogated and my to learn and unlearn uh, the things that have built me up to now. And that, I mean, uh, 2018 was my fight year and I worked very hard that year to work through myself, just like Ruth has said about working on herself um, with wisdom from other people as well. And I value collective wisdom. Lastly, I found a channel to express uh, my thoughts and, and my podcast has been a fantastic healing tool for me because as I've had conversations with other men, uh, as I've had conversations with other people about marriage, but just about life, I've, I've gotten perspective and life is about perspective. It's how you view it. And so, you know, if there are some things you can learn there from my healing process, then please take them. I'm still healing. Um, and I'm still going through that journey and I'm happy to have this conversation again six months from now and tell you if I've learned other things. Wow. I think th those are uh, great insights that uh, you have mentioned there. Uh, maybe Ruth, you can build on that and maybe tell us uh, uh, a bit of uh, your healing process that uh, uh, one of our followers uh, needs to at least know. And also, uh, if you still uh, believe uh, in marriage institution, you know, we've heard from a man, a man in which institution, so you can just put it in your own way what you believe in. And if given another chance, maybe you'll take it and go for it. Yeah. Um, I don't really believe in the marriage institution as is. I believe in a long term friendship and companionship and partnership that may look like what people call a modern day marriage. It may look like it, but it, it's really not it. I, I feel for mine will be richer and deeper if I do get a like-minded person. If not, I would rather hold my peace. Um, what uh, you had asked, you had asked, uh, oh, the healing journey, yeah. Oh, my healing journey was, oh, it was rebellious. It was, there, there, I was rogue. There for five years, there were five years I was seriously rogue. Um, uh, a very, I, I set up to prove theories about uh, men in the most um, naughty and crazy way possible. <laughs> You'd be surprised collecting my own data in my own uh, wild and crazy ways. I let myself lose. That's what I did. I didn't care what um, people thought a good girl should be because I'd considered myself a good girl. Uh, so I became myself. I wanted to see how wild I can, I can, I can get, how far I can switch. So my healing journey for those who have who have watched it, they, they wouldn't believe I'm the sober person seated here today. It was a, a, a bit of a wild ride, but I have great memories from those days. I truly don't regret it as wild as it was. Um, but it, it also introduced me to myself, Jenny. I, I, I really didn't know myself. You have a lot of time alone. Like for us, our marriage didn't have children, thank God. Uh, so I, I had a lot of time to understand who I am what I'm about, whose I am, why do I do the things I, I, I do, what are my talents, what are my giftings. I, I, I literally went to school to learn about myself by doing a lot of internal work, a lot, which I still do. And, and just like Amania would say, I'm a work in progress because there are things I still discover about myself that need a lot of working on and a lot of presenting to God for help on how to work on them and also to lead on, on character traits I would like to improve. So healing really is never complete. It's a journey. When you start dating again, like dating seriously, not uh, the games I, I used to have, you also realize um, there's still so much work to be done because there are, there are triggers you need to work on. Um, the, 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 the probably serious relationships I've had have made me again roll back and hold hold relationships at bay for some time, like serious relationships at bay because of uh, the work I still think needs to be, to be done. But I'm at that point where now I feel I will not be much of a liability to someone. My past won't be a liability to someone. Um, of course, divorce care, the divorce care program, which Jenny, you, you lead at Parklands Baptist was great for me because it made me come face to face 
with my demons. <laughs> it, it really did. And um, I thank God for that program because it brought in uh, a sense of sobriety back to my life. So have I perfected it? No, but I'm at a great advanced stage, a stage where I can be a blessing to another person who's hurting. I think that the, the greatest gift of, he, of the healing journey, and I was sharing this with someone the other day, I used to long for this time, this time when I can sit and my heart is not aching. I really, I would imagine those times when I was so stressed, I was going mad, my heart was bleeding constantly. As long as I'm not asleep, you're just, your heart is just bleeding. I dreamed of a time when I would wake up and leave and I didn't have pain or my thoughts were not racing and I'm there now. So I love this place where, where I am at. I love the woman. I'm in love with the woman I've become and I'm in love with the life that I have been given to live and I'm going to live the hell out of it. That's for sure. So um, to any divorcee who's listening and, and is so devastated, this too shall pass. It might pass like a kidney stone, but it shall pass. So be patient with yourself. Seek therapy, 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 please. And, and, and um, uh, forgive me if there's any church person listening. I would avoid church therapy unless you're doing divorce care, the divorce care program, which is sponsored by a church, but you'd be surprised how realistic it is. Go for therapy that's real because the pain you're feeling is real. And I don't think um, the kind of therapy I've seen given, the kind of counseling I've seen being given in church is enough. So go to a certified therapist who will be able to help you with your emotions before they get the better of you. And you will heal. One day you will smile like, uh, uh, like Amani and, and myself and you'll speak to others without shedding tears and it will happen. So be patient with yourself, you'll heal. And thank you, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for um, the uh, inspiring words. And you want to add something, Amani? Yeah, Jenny, I, I, I thought I'd, I'd, add, I'd add something small, um, especially for people who are married currently and maybe in a tough space in their marriage. Um, there's an old Nigerian saying that says, well, I think it's Nigerian, but uh, the person who told it to me told, me told it to me in a Nigerian accent. It goes like this. A, a lizard in Legoso does not become an alligator in London. Um, it says a lizard in Lagos does not become an alligator when it gets to London. It's, it's a lizard in London as well. Uh, the, 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 I use this a lot when I'm doing uh, some training work for the corporate world, but I think it's very apt for marriage. I still am a proponent in a sense for marriage. And, and I think, you know, there's a, there's a place for people to fight for their relationships. The, the, what you're hearing Ruth and I say is a result of a lot of hard work. Uh, but if you are asked what we were in our marriages between a lizard and an alligator, I think we'd both say we were a lizard. Uh, we have worked very hard to become an alligator. I think it's possible for you to become the alligator in your marriage if you if you're willing and humble enough to put in the work now don't imagine that getting out there is a reason you'll be better unless it really is you know a space that an environment that endangers you or endangers your mental health um or, or, you know i'd say there is a place for us to work in our marriages and We've made quitting look too easy. We've made it look you know, very acceptable. We've made it even fashionable. And if we have, I'm sorry, it was not easy. It was painful. And there are moments I think I, I, I did have choices that I could have made differently. And so for you, who is in that space, who is making a consideration like this, is it possible that you can work at being the kind of person that you should be in this marriage? And if that's possible, then do that first. That's what I wanted to say. Wow. I think I love that message. Well, that message, it's deep, it's deep. And for sure you have spoken to many marriages, to people who are married. 
And sometimes we make it uh, look easy, like uh, being out here, it's easy, but for sure, well, I've heard from you from Ruth, it's not that easy. So it's better if you can work it out that early, I think that it will save you a lot of uh, heartache. Thank you for all your comments. Uh, and uh, I know uh, time has really gone. I would uh, just take a, a parting shot as we wrap up uh, a parting shot and maybe as you do your parting shot, just tell us where you can be found so that our, our viewers can, uh, can find you there for more inspiring uh, messages. Uh, you can go Monica, then Ruth and we finish with uh, Amani. Just parting shot one as we okay. bring this to a close. Yeah. Okay, uh, there is hope for marriage. Uh, those who are preparing to get married, uh, there is hope. Uh, but for those who are uh, have issues, it's good to seek a therapy. And uh, of course, from uh, a certified psychologist. And uh, for those who are in marriage, remember, just like the way we do services to our cars and the way we repaint, and repair our homes, we need to do the same to our marriages. Those who are married, remember, know the love language of your partner. Have the, the know-how, know how and what they, they, they really love. If it's the word of affirmation, if it is gifts, if it's acts of service, do it for that one person who is your life partner. And even of course, physical touch and such things. Those are love languages. Just know your partner and do it to your love, you know, your marriage partner. Uh, we are located at Daguriti Kona and uh, Wanye Road, and we are called Elim Marriage, uh, Elim, Elim Marriage Missions. And you can find us there. I don't know whether we are supposed to give our contacts Jenny? Uh, yeah, you can mention, is it uh, on Facebook or something where they can go and find you? Okay. Or we are, contacts, uh, you can give your contacts so anybody can write. Yeah. Okay. We are on Facebook, uh, L Ministry. Uh, and also you can reach us uh, through 0750658480. Thank you. Yes, Ruth, your parting shot? Uh, parting shot is that uh, when you're married, for those who are married, um, remember that um, anybody is replaceable. You're not indispensable. So work at your marriage. Put down the pride. Um, there are people who think that their partner can't leave them, so they won't work at themselves. You are indispensable. Even that person who's... Um, held um, uh, held on to you and has said they'll never leave you until they're six feet under, like I used to tell my ex-husband. Um, a point comes when a human being can only take so much. Work mm -hmm. at your marriage to the very best that you can so that if it, if it falls apart, um, I think there's, a, there's, this, there's, this, there's this part of you that's not guilty because you gave your best and seek to understand the other person for who they are. That's very important and also show up as yourself. Well, um, you can reach me on my, um, I, I'll give the Healing Boudoir email. I'll also put it in the comments. Uh, Healing Boudoir is a very new space publicly, but it's been um, a private space within the divorcee cohort. Uh, but you can reach me on Gmail at, at thehealingboudoir at gmail.com. I'll be glad to connect with you. Um, the YouTube page is The Healing Boudoir, just as is. It only has one video, it's still developing. So be patient with me, I'll get to, my, uh, I'll get to Amani's um, you know, caliber um, of, of saying go to episode 40. So with time, I'll, 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 I'll get there. Yeah. So thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. You'll, you'll probably be bigger. And I, and I really wish you all the best in, in your in your content creation. I, I think it's a very brave step and, you know, please don't stop, keep going. Um, my parting shot, marriage is not bad. 
that's my parting shot. Uh, my marriage was not was not all bad. You know, my marriage had wonderful moments, and I had uh, I was blessed with two wonderful children from that marriage who are in my life and I love dearly. Um, and they have a good mother, and you know. I actually think I made the most progress in my life when I was married. So there's there's a lot of good in marriage. I, I hope we don't scare you as well <laughs> from getting married. You know, um, that's my parting shot. Marriage can be can be wonderful. How you can reach me um, at Amani Maranga. Um, that's on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, and I respond to DMs. Sometimes I delete, it, but I respond. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the easiest way to get to me at Amani Maranga on Facebook, on Twitter, or on uh, Instagram. Wow. Oh, Je yeah. Jenny, uh, you asked yes. one last question. Would I do it again? Oh, yeah. Yes. But just totally differently. I'll, I'll definitely do it again, but I would rather not be called a wife and I would rather not call him a husband. Let's be friends. Let's be lifetime friends. Wow. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the panelists, I want to appreciate you so much. I know many people have benefited from your sharing, from your uh, candid, inspiring uh, stories. And also to just comment, uh, Lina Tenner, well, she said that it was great seeing these great minds in the same space. You've uh, talked to many, you've touched many, and I want to believe there are many marriages that will be healed through uh, this conversation because that it's our, uh, our objective just to have, to speak to many marriages and many people who are struggling. So I want to appreciate just for finding that time to come and be a blessing to other people and also to our viewers. Thank you so much for staying on and just uh, listening and even your feedbacks we have seen and uh, even the ones we haven't responded, we'll make sure that we have responded. Thank you so much. Uh, I will end uh, with a quote by Johnny Cash that says, you built on failure, you use it as a stepping stone, close the door to the past. You don't try to forget the mistakes, but you don't let it have any of your energy or any of your time or any of your space. Until we meet next month, I've been your host, Jenny Washira. Have a blessed night. Thank you, thank you.